So as many of you have heard, we are releasing a brand new version of RAS. This isn't a new release, this is a complete rewrite and we're calling it RAS 2025. And that shouldn't be optimistic. This should come out at, towards the end of this year. But I wanted to generate a little demo to let you know what's coming and give you a sense of what the features and capabilities would be. We are going to make a project like this, but we're just gonna start over. So I'm gonna go to projects this will take us to kind of the splash screen. You'll see that all of the projects I've been working on here, you can go down and it gives you a little thumbnail of what's going on. Just the, the interface is just so much more cool, so much more interactive. Uh, you can do automatic releases. I'm up to date, but if there's a new release or a new patch, it's going to show up right here, which will happen a lot in the early alpha days. But I'm just going to go over here and say new project. And this is going to give me a dialogue to open the project. And I'm just going to call this 2025 demo. And then what you'll notice is that we are geospatial first, which means that we're not going to wait for you to open a map to ask projection. We're going to ask you for projection. And you'll see there are actually a lot of ways to get a projection. We, you can go find one on a map. There'll be a lot of cool interactive tools. You can also do it the old fashioned way. You know, here I have a projection from a shape file. So you can just pull that over here and that will immediately identify your projection. And one of the nice things about 2025 is it'll be able to strip projections off of anything because it's geospatial. So eventually you can just bring in your train and it'll strip the projection off of that. But for now, what you'll see is that, hey, it's recognized this projection. Um, and so we're going to create our project. And what you'll notice is that RAS basically is Mapper. You know, RAS looks like Mapper uh, because we've kind of gotten rid of all the, you know, quasi 1990s interfaces uh, and we're just you know working off of a map. And so the first thing, because we want to work off a map, is we're going to uh, bring in our train. And so here I've just got a TIFF file and I'm just going to drag that over here and it will recognize it and I'll import it. And now I have my terrain file. And so one thing you'll notice, one thing Josh has worked on quite a bit here is that we actually have native street maps. Now that it's georeferenced and you have a projection, uh, there's going to be this just basic street map layer that will always kind of be available and that doesn't really take much time to go in and out to get it off of the internet. Okay, so we've got our train. The next thing we need to do is create our mesh. Now, mesh generation is going to be one of the biggest differences because, well, that's awesome. The mesh tools in RAS are going to be quite a bit improved. And so we're just going to start by creating a geometry. And then under our geometry, we're going to develop our conceptual mesh. You know, mesh generation technology is going to be quite a bit different, uh, and uh, there's a lot of strengths to that. And so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to create a mesh. And the first thing you'll notice is that I'm not actually going to create a polygon. I'm going to create arcs. And the polygons will be made of arcs, and you'll see the power of that very quickly. But I'm just going to start out with an arc here, and then let's say... I'm going to make this channel quasi 1D here. And then you'll notice that it recognizes each of these as an arc, but it also recognizes the whole thing as a region. And so now if I choose here, we actually have a number of different of meshing tools. I actually want to make these in quads in line. And so we're going to say that the length is 100. And then I'm going to say I actually want, you know, five. And so now if I come up here and say regenerate mesh, you'll notice that we fit these nice quads to the direction of flow. Okay, so I actually maybe want to refine that a little bit more. Let me actually go in and I'm going to put in essentially break lines, but uh, but they're actually going to be indistinguishable from the arcs we used just to develop our polygons. And our regions. Okay, so now I've actually got three regions here. And what I want to do is I want to keep that 100, but I want to make this quasi 1D. So I'm going to turn each of these into a quasi 1D uh, reach. So basically, I've got one cell wide. Now, if I regenerate my mesh, you'll see we've got this kind of quasi 1D reach where I've got three cells wide and uh, they're 100, 100 foot spacing. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to come in here and I'm going to continue 
this kind of quasi 1D reach. And I think I want to stop it there because we've got some interesting structure there. And so we'll come along here and and then I'll do the same thing out here. And I'm just going to make each of these a kind of quasi 3D, quasi 2D reach. So that I've got a single cell wide and 100 foot long. All right, and so now if I generate the reach, we continue to do that. Okay, so now I, I want to continue this kind of 1D reach here, and so we'll do that. And I would be much more careful with this if it was an actual project, but since it's a demo, I'm trying to move through it pretty quickly. And so, again, these regions are just made up of arcs. And the reason we do that is so that the arcs themselves can have different properties in order to define the width and the length of these cells. Okay, so now we'll go ahead and do the same thing. We'll keep that 100 foot and we'll change this to a quasi 1D and generate the mesh. And then we'll do something similar out here and then we'll add a different type of node over on the over on the overbank. All right, and then now let's do something different in the overbanks. This model doesn't actually flood, so I'm not going to be super careful about this. You'll notice I only made that as one arc because we're actually going to use the triangles here. And then I'll do the same thing over here. And then when we regenerate the mesh, now we've got this kind of quasi 1D model in the middle and we've got the triangles for the overbanks. Okay, now next we're going to add boundary conditions. One of the nice things about the boundary conditions in the new model is that they are completely geospatial. The actual location of the boundary conditions there isn't in your geometry file. It's just kind of part of the boundary condition. So you come in here and you say, hey, I want to define a boundary condition here. And it says, okay, what kind of boundary condition do you want? And we're going to choose flow. And then and then I actually have a hydrograph here. So I'm gonna go and just copy that hydrograph. And it's a 15 minute hydrograph, so I'll choose minute and 15. And then I'll just come in here and sit a control V and there we go. Now I've got my hydrograph. And then I need a downstream boundary condition. So I'm going to move downstream and zoom in here and here I'm going to want normal depth. So I'll just go in and double click and create a new boundary condition. And here I'm going to choose normal depth. And for normal depth, I'll say this is pretty steep. So it's a 0 0.01 slope on the normal depth. And my boundary conditions are done. Uh, the next thing that I'm going to need is an n value layer. Now, there are a number of different ways to do n values. They're all in these map layers. And if you right click on this, you can add a new n value layer. You can add a new classification layer. When you add a new classification layer, you can automatically pull in data from the NLCD database. But for now, let's just do an, a base n value layer. And I'll just say that everything's going to be 0 0.04. But obviously, we could go in and use these classifications to you know, define the, ch the concrete channel and things like that. All right. So now I've got an n value. I've got my geometry file, I've got my flow file, I'm going to go create a plan. And so my for my plan, I need to choose my geometry file and my flow file. And then I've got my start time and my end time. Let's actually run this for a little bit longer. Let's run this for 18 hours. And uh, my time step, I'm going to say 10 seconds, but this is explicit. So it's actually going to compute the necessary time step. And then the last thing that I'll look at here is 
you know, we've got eight cores. This model is just too simple for eight cores. So let's just run it on one core. It's not going to get a lot of value out of multi-core. Then we're going to compute. And you'll see that it generates a plan result. And if you go here, you can open the compute log. That'll show you kind of what's going on. I can even dock the compute log over here. Uh, one of the nice things, though, is that you don't actually have to wait for the results. So we can go in here before this is even done running and start to look at results. And then we are done running. So let's actually take a closer look at this. We'll, uh, we'll look at our depth re results. And then we can go over here and look at our velocity results. We can do better with our mesh. We can do different things, but as a you know opening offer, that's kind of how the workflow of RAS 2025 works. The meshing tools are really strong. It's going to be a lot easier to make simple models, and the explicit solver is going to let us you know utilize GPU and other techniques to run faster. So that's a very very brief introduction to RAS 2025, just to give you a flavor of what's coming. I'm Stanford Gibson, the Sediment Transport Specialist at HCC, and this has been a preview of. RAS 2025.